Welcome everyone to our webinar. Every January, I like to have a webinar uh, thinking more about the implications of dietary choices, especially since it's a time of year when many people are having New Year's resolutions and thinking about dietary changes. So today's discussion is on the impact of dietary choices for health, the environment and social justice, and we're excited to see so many of you uh, in person today, as well as many more who uh, plan to watch this later. And uh, really delighted to have four amazing speakers today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Matthew Hayek, who's an assistant professor in environmental studies at NYU. His scientific research examines the environmental impacts of our food system with a specific focus on greenhouse gas emissions and land use change. To do so, he makes use of statistical modeling and large geospatial data. Dr. Hayek received his PhD in environmental sciences and engineering from Harvard University, which was followed by a postdoctoral appointment at Harvard Law School. He is also an affiliated faculty member in the NYU Center for Data Science and NYU Wild Animal Welfare Program. Dr. Hayek will discuss climate change on our plate. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Stacy. And it's just uh, fantastic to be here. Let's see, okay, make sure my slides are shared. Um, it's, it's such a, uh, honor to be part of this panel, which is just really interdisciplinarity in action um, from uh, Stacy's expertise in cancer with NYU Langone uh, and having these cross-cutting conversations across health, social justice, well-being, and climate change. So I predominantly focus on the climate change angles. I have a background of environmental science um, but hopefully we can kind of try to find some more of the connective tissue to all these other diverse topics that we're talking about today. So it is interdisciplinarity in action at the NYU Department of Environmental Studies. It is studies, not just science. And we really span as a whole department, the range between natural and physical sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. So today I'm gonna to be talking about um, food choices, how climate change really is on our plates, as well as a bit uh, of some illuminating conversation on the limits of quote unquote green, sustainable or regenerative animal agriculture and try to um, emphasize that we really do have an imperative to try to eat lower on the food chain. And there are lots of ways to do that of, 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 of which humane, more humane, regenerative and sustainable animal agriculture can be a part of that as long as we're reducing the overall amounts of consumption. So a bit of a primer zooming way out on climate change, global warming is caused by emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And the most predominant one of those greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. It's the most abundant greenhouse gas and it's the causing the most global warming, even adjusting for the fact that different gases cause different amounts of warming. It comes primarily from burning fossil fuels and that contributes about three quarters of all warming. However, agriculture contributes about an additional quarter to one third of greenhouse gas emissions. And those are three greenhouse gases that contribute to it. Carbon dioxide, um, mainly coming from deforestation and other land use changes. Methane, predominantly coming from cow belches and manure and also things like rice production. And nitrous oxide, which is like the other other greenhouse gas that gets ignored even when we're talking about the ignored greenhouse gases. It is the lonely third sibling, but re is responsible for about five to 7% of overall global warming. And that predominantly comes from manure, as well as crop fertile manufacturing and applying crop fertilizers, and even from the roots of legumes, which we've planted way more than have historically existed, think soy. Um, but where is all that, those crops and animal, uh, 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 crops and emissions from those crops and animal agriculture um, coming from and, and what, is, what is it contributing to? Well, as I said, it's about a quarter to a third of all emissions. And if we just take out the animal agriculture component of that, 
despite animal agriculture not contributing a majority of our calories globally, or even a majority of our protein, it's responsible for about one third of our protein consumption globally, the other two thirds is crops. Animal agriculture is responsible for 10 to 20% of all emissions. You may have heard more precise estimates than that, but there are so many uncertainties in this estimate that I, as a scientist, cannot actually give you any more precision than that. And if we look at the different foods that they come from, not all foods are created equal. Here on the y-axis is different types of foods, and on the x-axis is the amount of greenhouse gas emissions they're responsible. But in the colors on that x-axis are the sources of, uh, uh, or the sectors that are producing those greenhouse gases in order from even before the farm gate to manufacturing, transport, and resale, and uh and, uh, and packaging. And what we see is two main things, one of which is many of the animal sourced foods are at the top of these greenhouse, this list of greenhouse gas emissions with plant sources of protein like peas, soy milk, um, ground nuts, that is peanuts towards the bottom of the list, but also that the production of food is responsible for the vast majority of those greenhouse gas emissions. Land use change, farm farming, uh, and farm-based emissions and producing the animal feed to feed the crops to feed animals. If we look at transport, meanwhile, transport is only responsible for about 4% of food systems greenhouse gas emissions, meaning that what you eat is far more important than where it comes from. And it may look at this point like I'm being a little harsh on animal agriculture. Certainly aren't there some forms of sustainable animal agriculture. And um, the, the um, part of this conversation that I want to bring as having a background in the natural sciences is the fact that you have to burn calories before you gain calories. And that applies to us, and that also applies to animal agriculture, meaning that animals cannot capture all of the energy or nutrients that are being fed to them. Many are lost in terms of wastes like urine, feces, as well as just even body heat. Um, so it takes about nine calories of feed to produce one calorie of chicken, 12 for pigs for one calorie of pork, and 40 for cattle for one calorie of beef. Um, and so this means that animal agriculture contributes a large, um, is a large loss of human edible calories in the food supply. However, um, beef cattle can eat um, calories like from grass that we as humans can eat, but it also means that they're responsible for a huge fraction of land use just to graze all of those calories from inedible grass so that they can ferment them and turn turn that into body weight. So um, if we look at all of the food we eat, this is not an actual map of land use, but it divides land use into big chunks based on how we use it. Notice that all of the housing in the United States could just be the size of, um, is equivalent to just the size of New England in the mid-Atlantic. Meanwhile, all the food we eat is um, that is directly consumed as crops is about the size of the state of you know Illinois and um, uh, Illinois and Indiana, maybe half the state of Ohio put together, versus all of the land that we're using to produce livestock feed and export feed is about three times that. Meanwhile, the ranges on which cow, cattle and pasture graze just in the first part of their life is like thirty percent of the surface of the earth. This means that globally. Animal agriculture takes up about um, one third of all of the habitable land on earth. That is about a quarter of all land if you consider barren and ice, ice ridden places. Um, so livestock land use for their crops and their grazing is equivalent to all of the area of the Americas. And as I mentioned, perhaps uh, cattle could just graze grasses. Um, whereas the feedlots in which they're fed corn and soy at the very end of their lives what would happen if we took that out of commission? And instead of them competing for those edible, edible calories like corn and soy that we as humans can eat, we were to only feed them grass. Uh, as part of a study, we ran a model where we um, kind of, that incorporated these assumptions and looked at all the demographics and land uses of cattle across the country. And we found that removing grain-fed feedlots from, from cattle and just feeding them grass 
would require in the first part 30% more animals than the 77 million we already use in the United States for beef production. So up to 100 million cattle because they fatten up more slowly and reach lower overall slaughter weights than cattle that are fed grain. Meanwhile, those cattle eating entirely grass and more of them would produce 43% methane from enteric fermentation or belches and would require the use of two to uh, um, rather 60% to 270% more land than we already use, which essentially means that America could not shift entirely to grass-fed beef without stealing a bunch of land from Canada and Mexico and another of other countries just to keep up our beef addiction. Um, Meanwhile, this parses really well with findings from other regeneratively grazed or regenerative meat production areas. This example of a regeneratively grazed ranch in Georgia, um, while it emitted somewhat fewer greenhouse gas emissions overall, required two and a half times the land use of conventional meat, fitting very well with our, our model of what would happen if the entire country did this. Meanwhile, um, quote, better chickens on pasture, that is chickens that are a bit more humanely raised, reach lower overall slaughter weights, don't have issues with breaking their leg bones because they're gaining so much weight. If we were to raise those chickens and put them on pasture, um, that is, uh, again, those slower growing breeds, this would require 49 to 61% more land than is already being used both for chicken production and the grain production to feed those chickens and would require 45 to 87% more chickens. So while each one of those chickens had a more, quote, humane life, we would need to be raising and slaughtering and potentially even confining more chickens overall in order to make that a possibility, which really means that if you wanna maximize the benefits of eating more regeneratively and sustainable forms of meat, we need to eat much less of it overall. Um, and these land uses are not just, um, you know, what space do these uh, uh, animals in their diets use up, but what types of opportunities are we foregoing potentially to restore um, ecosystems and prevent climate change? So if you look at Massachusetts in the late 1880s, most of New England was deforested. It was hay fields producing low productivity, cattle and sheep, as well as the um, forages like hay, corn silage, um, clover, to feed those animals. And we went from much of England only having 10% forest cover to now having um, more than 50% across New England. This uh, picture of Swift River Valley in Massachusetts just being one example. And this was sucking up carbon dioxide ever since animal agriculture was abandoned in the area. Here's another picture from um, the Harvard Forest near Petersham, Massachusetts. Um, so if we look at some of the problems associated with animal agriculture, this is the eastern Amazon in the east, eastern Brazilian Amazon where I did my research. And we can see these characteristic fishbone scars of deforestation all over. Um, but what is this? This is a picture of upstate New York between Utica and Syracuse that is predominantly producing uh, hay and silage for animal agriculture, namely for dairy production in the area. And this also represents an opportunity for reforestation if we were to move away from animal agriculture. If we did this en masse, then um, instead of a business as usual diet by the year 2050 emitting carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in the positive y-axis, a less meat diet and a no meat diet would actually have the chance to regrow forests and sequester carbon dioxide here on the negative y-axis, sucking our greenhouse gas emissions back out of the atmosphere in the process. And here we create a map of where this sequestration could potentially occur. So with that, I want to hand it over to some of my colleagues and to talk a little bit more about the implications of animal agriculture from another uh, a number of other environmental, social, and ethical um, perspectives and health perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayek. That was amazing. Uh, we will move on now to our next speaker, Jamie Berger, who's the writer and producer of The Smell of Money, a feature length documentary about a community's fight against the world's largest pork company. Throughout her career, Jamie has used writing and visual storytelling to draw attention to issues ranging from environmental racism to the climate crisis to other injustices wrought against people, animals, and the planet. Thank you so much, Jamie.
Thank you so much for having me. Bear with me for one moment while I set up my shared screen here. Make sure I can share some sound. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for having me here. Thank you so much, Stacy, and thank you, Dr. Hayek, for that presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing the others. That was very, very informative. Wonderful to to learn more about the climate impact of, of the food that we eat. Um, so as Stacy said, my uh, film is The Smell of Money. It's a feature length documentary about a community fighting the pork industry in North Carolina. And when we set out on this journey to, to learn about this issue, the question we were asking was truly, how does industrial animal agriculture impact communities? How does it impact people? Who is paying the price for the food that we eat? So I'll talk a bit about the, some of the people in the film as well as the issues that we explore through it. First, I'd love to start off with showing you just a, a brief portion of the trailer. And hopefully you are able to see the sound. If someone could give me a thumbs up if you're able to hear this once it starts. Can you hear it? Okay. They go. are poisoning our soil, poisoning our groundwater, poisoning people, fellow Americans. They are stealing from them in the present and stealing from future generations. If it does not touch you in an emotional way, if you really get in to look at this issue, whether it's from an environmental standpoint, a, a, an animal rights issue, whether it's a human rights issue, whether it's an antibiotic use issue, if you can walk away from this saying, no big deal, you need to come talk to me, come spend, let me take you for three days and let you sit down and talk to these people who have to live with this every day. Matter of fact, let me let you live in their shoes for a day and see if it doesn't change your mind. No, and ain't nobody helping us do nothing. They don't care because we're black. We're back up in the country. I just hope my house don't get burned up tonight from top of the year. I'm sure he's somewhere peeping now. You can believe that. He got his boys on you. What make you think you have a right to set up a hog farm and destroy my way of life? People don't have access to clean air and clean water anymore. One of the most disturbing stories that I've heard is the sensation of being sprayed with shit, basically. Right, I'm going to stop it there for the sake of time, just to give you a bit of a preview of the film and, and some of the topics that we get into. I and to next screen. So our, our film focuses largely on this wonderful person, Elsie Herring. She was born on this land um, that her grandfather had purchased after he was freed from slavery. Uh, he grew up there, she grew up there, and uh, her father built this home that you see, see in the background behind her. She went off to college, actually up to New York, um, to pursue her, her career there and her studies, and then came home once her elderly mother started getting sick. Um, and when one day she and her mother were sitting on this front porch that you see behind her and they started to feel droplets raining down on them. But they quickly understood that this was not actually rain, it was animal waste that the farmer next door had started spraying over their home. Um, and this actually happened um, on land that the farmer had stolen from her family, again, land that her grandfather had, had purchased uh, after he was freed. So this started for Elsie a, a journey that would last the rest of her life to try to get justice for herself and her family and her community members. And she became an incredible advocate for, for changes to, to protect the people that she loved. So I'll come back to her in a little bit, but want to start off talking a little bit more about what this issue looks like in North Carolina on a broader scale. So when we picture a farm, this is still what many of us imagine, that those kinds of free range uh, farms that Dr. Hayek showed you all, um, sort of open, open fields, roaming animals, you know, big red barns. But this is actually much more what modern farms look like today. This is a very standard hog farm in North Carolina. And to break this down a little more, I'll, you can take a look at this kind of aerial uh, image of what's called a concentrated animal feeding operation or CAFO. The animals are housed in those facilities and when they're when they produce you know waste, um, feces and urine that's swept 
uh, underground up into what the industry calls a lagoon, which is typically the size of several football fields. And this is just essentially a huge open hole in the ground. It's just a big pit in the earth that they dug out and put, put this waste in. When this lagoon fills up, they have to do something with that waste. So they pump it out over to spray over fields, kind of under the pretext of raising crops, but really it's just a cheap, cheap way of, of getting rid of the waste. And this is what one of those sprayers looks like. It's essentially a gigantic kind of industrial scale sprinkler. And if you look closely here, you can see that when it's propelled out at such this, this high rate, much of it is turned into this kind of fine mist. And that's what then can trans, you know, um, be transported by the wind several miles um, over the, the surrounding communities and can land on, on nearby residences like Elsie's. This industry in North Carolina, there are about as many pigs as people in the state, and each one of these CAFOs produces an absolutely enormous amount of waste. Just waste from just two of these facilities is roughly equivalent to the amount that, of waste that the human population of North Carolina's capital produces. Again, this is a, an aerial footed, sorry, aerial image of uh, eastern North Carolina. If you were to fly over this region in a plane, you would see that these facilities are extremely densely concentrated. You see this kind of um, the barns and the, and the lagoons just dotted all over this part of the state. This is a, an especially an issue during hurricane season, which is quite, quite a, a common occurrence for, for folks in North Carolina. Um, hurricanes are, are frequent and becoming even more uh, dangerous and powerful and producing more and more flooding. Um, this is from a hurricane in the mid 90s where many of the, the facilities housing, housing animals in eastern North Carolina were completely flooded. And of course, um, that causes an issue for the lagoons as well, because when they are when they are compromised, when they, the floodwaters inundate them, the, the waste just kind of runs straight out into the floodwaters, into streams and, and rivers nearby. As you can imagine, this causes so many issues for the surrounding environment, uh, wildlife. This is a, a fish kill after a lagoon breached. Um, the, the floodwaters and, and polluted surface waters just on, on any average day can cause toxic algae blooms and other kind of conditions that are truly inhospitable to nearby wildlife. And this is particularly concerning because Eastern North Carolina relative to many other rural uh, areas is relatively highly populated, densely populated. Um, so you can see here, this is uh, again, kind of illustrating the, the concentration of these facilities and their proximity to homes. This causes a number of different uh, human health impacts, communities impacted by by industrial animal agriculture in North Carolina face higher rates of a number of different illnesses, infections, diseases, um, cancers. Um, they also experience a lot of different social harms. So de decreased property values because you know, who really would want to live in an area that's so, so saturated with animal waste? Um, of course, general quality of life is impacted. There are higher rates of anxiety and depression, many other problems, and, and even higher mortality rates in this part of the state compared with the North Carolina average. And this is something that we, we saw firsthand, you know, many of the people that we worked with through the film were experiencing a number of these kinds of issues and talked to us about the, the physical and emotional toll that this, this took on them. This is also considered a pretty textbook example of environmental racism, which is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on communities of color. This is a map that researchers created that kind of overlays the, the um, industrial hog operations with historical enslaved populations in North Carolina. And you can see there's a pretty clear correlation here. There's a pretty clear overlap. And, the researchers concluded based on, on their studies that the industry actively chose these locations to build these facilities because they knew that they would face less political pushback, um, that the people harmed would be less politically and, and economically powerful to stand up to them. I think there's a really powerful anecdote that illustrates this, which is that 
in the late 80s and into the 90s as the industry was exploding in North Carolina, the facilities were pre predominantly being constructed in communities of color. And it was only when one of these facilities was slated to be built near this place, which is a, a wealthy white community, a golf resort that has annual kind of golf championships, that the legislature passed a moratorium on the construction of new CAFOs. So it was only when this wealthy white community was threatened and they were contacting you know, their elected officials as the, the black community members had been doing for years and years and years, you know, their voices were heard and the moratorium was enacted. Of course, it, it grandfathered in all of the existing CAFOs, which is why we still see all of these issues present today. So to bring it back to Elsie, just want to underscore that she was, she and, and the other people in our film, you know, the other activists who we profile was not at all a passive victim of these circumstances. She fought for so many years. She uh, was a, a speaker. She traveled the country to talk about these issues, became a a source of, of knowledge and, and information for other communities who are fighting a similar fight across the country. Um, she did a lot of speaking with the media. She was on, on TV and featured in, in news outlets quite frequently. She attended town council meetings and spoke up to her, her legislators. She even um, testified for the U.S. Congress at one point. And she and other about 500 other residents of North Carolina also sued Smithfield, which is the world's largest pork company, over the nuisances that that they had experienced. And that's one of the kind of key um, sort of stories that we follow through the film is, is their fight in the in the courts. And these are some of the other folks that we profile in the movie. Our, our goal, again, was really to understand the human impact of industrial animal agriculture in, in exploring this issue. So we really strove to, you know, to put the human stories first to sort of center these people's experiences and their fight. Um, so I hope that you will you will check it out, watch it and, and learn through them about the impact that that pork production and, and industrial animal agriculture has has on people. And just to close out here, um, if you're interested in watching the full film, it, it is now available on demand as of last month. So these are the, the places that you can watch it. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Jamie, for that very uh, powerful story and your work on this documentary. I was... Uh, right in there for the premiere of this in New York City and just, you know, such a powerful film. And I, I do hope that everyone who's joined us today will, will watch the whole thing. So uh, congratulations on such a tremendous contribution. Um, so now uh, moving to our next speaker, who is Dr. Lori Gruen, who's a leading scholar in animal studies and feminist philosophy. She works primarily in ethics and social and political philosophy. She is the author and editor of over a dozen books, including Ethics in Animals, An Introduction, Entangled Empathy, and most recently, Animal Crisis, co-authored with Alice Crary. Dr. Gruen will discuss animal agriculture and feminism. Can you hear uh, me? Yes. yes. Great, great. Um, well, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, I'm really uh, excited. Let me see if I can get this started. How do I do that? Help, help. Um, okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, I'm really, really excited. Jamie, thank you so much for telling us about your new film. I can't wait to teach it. Um, Dr. Hyatt, great to see you learn from you every time you present. Um, and Stacy, thank you so much for putting together such a wonderfully diverse and interesting panel. Um, I wanted to talk very briefly about the intersection between um, sort of questions, we, we just went, we're talking about questions of environmental justice and I wanna talk a little bit about sort of broad issues of reproductive justice by focusing primarily on um, animals that are being exploited in the food industry 
um, based on their reproductive capacities. So looking specifically at the exploitation of the reproductive capacities of both chickens and cows. I'm always really surprised when I'm teaching um, that this idea of what Carol Adams called feminized protein isn't something that um, even students who are concerned about the environment, people who are concerned about the environment and concerned about animals really take on. So this is part of what I'm trying to highlight is that there's a really important sense in which um, female animals in particular are exploited in ways that are very, very um, disconcerting to put it mildly. So here what I have is uh, it, some images, very typical images um, in the top corner of laying hens um, being used to produce eggs. And you could see some of the eggs um, at the bottom there. There's an estimated six and a half billion laying hens that are um, producing eggs around the world. And each hen produces about 300 eggs per year. Most of them are kept in these small wire cages called battery cages. And there are sometimes up to eight birds in these small cages. They're stacked one on top of the other. Um, and every facility, not unlike the pig facilities that we just saw, um, can contain hundreds uh, maybe tens of thousands, sometimes up to 100,000 hens. The cage is uh, very uncomfortable. And the, because the, it's so stressful for the birds, even though they're mostly kept um, in controlled conditions of dark and light, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of boredom, fear, um, and they will often peck at each other is a response to that um, that disturbance. So one of the very common features of hen facilities is that their beaks will be cut off. The beak is a very sensitive part of a bird's body and they're often um, deformed as a result of these horrible debeaking processes that cause lasting pain um, and also can impair their ability to eat um, and drink and also to engage in um, their normal kind of preening or cleaning of each other. And because um, people often think that eggs you don't, it doesn't require killing the animal. It might have more ethical um, justification to do that kind of um, consumption. But I think that really it's important in this other photograph, what you see are the quote unquote waste products of this production process, which involves the male chicks. Um, every year there's about a million male chicks that are basically either ground up or gassed or sometimes just put in a plastic bag alive and left to suffocate as they're thrown away. Um, and this is because in this particular part of the egg production process, they're also reproducing more hens. So what they're doing, there's a group of, um, of eggs that are allowed to be fertilized to breed the next cycle of, of hens, but also in the process, you end up with these um, male chicks that are wasted, quote unquote. They're, they're not gonna be useful for the industry. But living as a battery hen isn't a whole lot better than being immediately killed um, after you're determined to be not a female. Um, indeed, I would suggest it's probably the worst life endured by any animal in the animal agriculture sector, um, except perhaps the sows that, um, that Jamie didn't really talk about, but they're also very strictly confined, also increasingly globally being um, stacked one on top of the other in these huge factories um, that cause quite a bit of distress. Um, so I think it's really important to understand why it's so distressing to live like this if you haven't thought much about um, chickens. Um, they begin laying eggs at between 18 and 20 weeks of age, and they're usually killed at about after when they're quote unquote spent. That's usually about um, a year later. They're then um, used in various kinds of low grade um, food stuff, 
pet food, some other kinds of products. But in their quote unquote natural, these particular hens don't have a natural environment, but jungle fowl from which these hens were um, created can live in really um, stable social groups of about 30 birds, not hundreds of thousands of birds. They establish a certain kind of social order, what you might have heard of as a pecking order. Um, and hens always nest, and they're not able to nest in industrial farming. Um, they form very strong ties to their chicks, bonding with them even before they're hatched. They often can be seen turning eggs and clucking kind of communicating um, with the devel developing chick. They're also very, very protective, which is where we get the term mother hen. Um, they will watch over their chicks, but they're also um, will protect them from predators. So in that sense, they're not really chickens or chickens that aren't, they're not afraid to protect and um, act out to protect their young. Um, Instead, what we see in that's in um, in more wild living um, chickens or jungle fowl, um, these kinds of behaviors these are completely frustrated in um, industrial chicken and egg production, and they're ultimately reduced. These beings that are quite uh, social, quite emotional, quite communicative, are are reduced to basically um, reproductive machines. The situation for dairy cows is not un, uh, not dissimilar in a way. The global estimate for milk production is over 230 billion gallons annually. And in the United States, just this past year, 2023, there were 9.4 million dairy cows. Um, and that number has been increasing steadily um, over the last decade. They produce vast amounts of milk, but it's at um, quite a uh, cost to these animals. Um, they are producing often more milk um, than the calories they can take in, and they begin to metabolize their own body in a process um, that the industry will sometimes refer to as milking off their backs. Um, as you can see in this image, their um, cows are milked by machines and they offer suffer from painful inflammation of their mammary glands. Um, they develop a, a condition called mastitis and the intensive confinement over the production of milk. And this is really important. The constant pregnancies put cows at greater risk for other painful infectious disease. Now I'm always surprised when my students are like, what do you mean constant pregnancies? Don't cows just make milk? Well, my students are, are always thinking that they didn't really know that of course cows don't just make milk. They have to be impregnated. Um, they, they produce milk for about 10 months um, after giving birth. Um, and then the cycle of being pregnant, impregnated again, having their infants separated from them and their production process begins again. So the cows have to be impregnated regularly and their calves have to be se separated from their mothers within the first 24 hours so that they do not drink the milk that um, is being produced for us. Mother cows often fight ferociously um, to protect the infants um, and they're often rarely succeed. Now, one of the things, as is the case in the um, egg production industry, one of the things that happens in the dairy industry is that the female babies are um, often used as replacement dairy producers. Um, and that leads to another problem with the male offspring, another quote unquote, dirty little secret um, of this industry. And one of the things that happens is that both the baby, both babies are taken away immediately, but if it is not a female um, calf who's going to be used in the, to reproduce um, more, more milk, um, the male calves used to be sent into the veal industry, um, but they are no longer, um, the veal industry is on decline. So it is, they're not using um, as many calves. It's not efficient for the farmers to bring the calves to slaughter. Um, so they often either just um, shoot them um, on site or what they'll do is leave them to starve or otherwise um, just tether them and let them uh, waste. Um, and this is 
uh, one of the things that happens um, to uh, roughly, you know, if you think about it, 50% of the offspring um, that are, are not going to go into um, meat production. But that doesn't have to be um, what happens. And I just want to uh, end by highlighting a really beautiful story. Um, and this is a photograph of a now a, a now a, a male cow, but he was at one point just a calf. He's on your left side, and his name is Maddox. He was rescued as a calf from one of these outfits where he was being left to starve. He was tethered just basically to a mailbox, and nobody was feeding him or giving him water. And so it was pretty easy to ask if they could just somebody could just take him. He was small enough to fit in a car, um, so somebody took him, brought him to the sanctuary, and he grew, and he's about three years old in this photograph, when suddenly his mother, Moxie, just also rescued from the dairy um, where um, where Maddox was um, also rescued. And this is their first encounter. And I think it's so remarkable because this is three years later, um, and three years later, it looks as if this touch is a touch of recognition. Um, and it shows that mother um, and child um, are being fundamentally psychologically disrupted by the process that's gone on in this um, production of dairy. So the exploitation of the reproductive labor of these animals and the disregard of their sort of relationships and their with their offspring, I think parallels particular ideological commitments in US politics right now. And the reproductive justice movement has been working to allow women the right to control our sexuality, our gender, and our reproduction by having power and resources to make healthy decisions about our own bodies and our own families. And at the core of reproductive justice concerns is the belief that all women have the right to have children or the right not to have children, and the right to nurture the children that we have in safe and healthy environments, environments that we're not seeing in North Carolina, environments that we're not seeing um, all around the country, and indeed environments that are fundamentally denied animals um, who are reproducing on dairy farms and as well as in egg factories. So many feminist theorists have been arguing that female animals deserve a similar set of freedoms from the exploitation and the domination that is um, happening with controlling female animal bodies in a way um, that has a naturalized the notion of what it is that is happening in reproduction. And the control that's being exercised on animals is in some ways you can think of test case um, for that that's being exercised now over women and girls. Um, there's a lot more I could say about the exploitation and disregard for women's reproductive health and reproductive self-determination in other animals, but maybe we can leave that so we can hear our final speaker. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gruen. That was extremely informative. And, and uh, thank you also for uh, highlighting the beautiful animal sanctuaries. Uh, it is quite nice. Uh, there's so many that are just lovely to visit, especially for families like the Catskill Animal Sanctuary and get to uh, witness firsthand some of these wonderful bonds that you demonstrated. So I'd like to uh, go next to our final speaker, Dr. Sapna Shah, who's an associate professor at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, an internist at Bellevue Hospital, and the director of the Bellevue Lifestyle Medicine Program. She is passionate about promoting lifestyle medicine and nutrition to optimize the health of her patients. She co-authored a review article about how plant-based diets can prevent and reverse diabetes in 2017, and more recently co-authored papers on the implementation, clinical outcomes, and behavioral outcomes of the pilot phase of the Bellevue Plant-Based Lifestyle Medicine Program. Dr. Shaw will be discussing the health benefits of plant-based diets. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me here and being on this panel. It's been excellent to hear these other speakers. Um, and I just wanted to say that I actually became vegan for ethical reasons about 11 years ago 
for um, after I visited the farm sanctuary up in the Catskills and I saw how animals were suffering in the industrial animal agriculture. Um, and I realized I didn't want any part of it. And I um, I realized at that time that, um, you know, I don't want to have any animals in my own diet, but how am I going to stay? I, I was wondering, how am I going to stay healthy just eating, um, you know, not eating any animal products? And I was worried about my calcium and protein intake and, you know, much um, much of the same concerns that a lot of people have, I think, when they decide to become vegan. And that's when I came across this huge body of literature that showed not only could I be, um, would I not be harmed by having a vegan diet, but if planned appropriately, I actually can um, improve my health um, by uh, eliminating animal products from my diet. And actually the same type of um, healthy diet would be actually beneficial for my patients to find out about. Um, and I had been practicing for over 10 years at this point, um, and I'm an internist. So I see diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, cardiovascular disease day in and day out. And I was just shocking that I hadn't heard about this or ta been taught this in my medical school or residency. Um, so I just wanted to share after I I learned about the health benefits and I started sharing this with my patients. Um, this was um, like a, this was one of the uh, cases early on that really uh, made me committed to learning more about the benefits and and sharing this with patients. But this is a 48 year old patient of mine who I'd been taking care of for many years with high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. Um, and I had over the summer time uh, started him on insulin um, because his A1C was persistently elevated. And so this is our three month follow up. And um, his A1C was now under control on insulin and three other medications. His cholesterol was well controlled on medication and his blood pressure was controlled. And I thought, yay, success, you know, and he was really dejected because he really didn't want to be on insulin. He was young and um, he didn't foresee that kind of a life for himself. And luckily, you know, he, he asked me, what can I do to avoid being on insulin? And normally up until that point, I would have said, you know, this is just a chronic disease and it's expected that over time the pancreas will fail and many people will go on to have, um, need medications. But I actually had just read how to reverse diabetes, um, by Neil Barnard, um, using a plant-based diet by just taking out the saturated fats, which are, uh, predominantly found in animal products and replacing that with plant foods. And you can actually treat the source or the, uh, the problem with uh, with insulin resistance. Um, and so I shared with him this information and asked him to look look at the book that I was, you know, I had just finished reading. And three months later, he um, was so excited that he came in, he was 30 pounds lighter just from making the dietary changes. Um, and he really predominantly ate out. So instead of having a bacon, egg and cheese at McDonald's, he had the oatmeal. Um, he would have a bean burrito at Chipotle instead of, um, you know, at, at, without the sour cream and the cheese. And um, and he would just have like veggie burgers and just making those changes. His blood pressure um, had come down uh, and on he had actually reduced his blood pressure medications. But more importantly, his diabetes was was controlled for the first time ever. He was not even on any insulin or the uh, two other medications. He was just on one medication, metformin. Um, because he noticed that his sugars were coming down rapidly when he made these changes and his cholesterol was controlled off no medications. And to me, it was shocking because I had never learned about this in medical school and I was training residents and medical students. And I, you know, I, I had not been giving them the tools that they can use to actually help patients heal their, uh, underlying chronic diseases. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to share with you that these are the leading causes of death. And this is a report in 2015 and of the top 10 um, leading causes of disease, seven of them are related to diet. And when you look at what is the risk factor most contributing to chronic diseases in this country, it's actually diet. An unhealthy diet is what contributes to, um, is the number one risk factor for, um, for dying from diseases in this country. And, um, you know, people are very confused as to what is a healthy diet, right? So, Luckily for us, um, the Eat Lancet report came out in 2019, and this was a, you know, it convened scientists from around the world, um, experts in uh, in health and um, nutrition, and as well as environmental studies. And they looked at what is the best diet for human health that is also compatible with uh, environmental health, the planet's health. And this is kind of a, how a typical plate should look for people to have uh, to optimize their health. Half of the plate should be vegetables. And then the other half should be really emphasizing um, whole grains, plant sources of protein. So they're talking about beans, legumes, chickpeas, tofu, soy, 
Um, and the fats that we consume should be coming from plant sources. So that's nuts and seeds. And we really should be minimizing the amount of added sugars, animal sources of protein um, and, and uh, dairy products. It's not necessary to have. And if we do consume it, it should be in small amounts. And the reason for that was basically because all of these chronic diseases that we have in this country are very related to the consumption of animal products. And by just replacing those with plant foods, whole plant foods, we can see a reduction in all of these chronic diseases that we see on the left-hand side, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, Alzheimer's, strokes, fatty liver, kidney disease, uh, autoimmune conditions, cancers, obesity. Um, you could live longer as a result of making these kind of changes. And when you look at the science for why this is, um, there's so many reasons for why a healthful plant-based diet um, works. And that's, you know, it's, it's low in energy density. So it's low in saturated fats and high in fiber content to help people maintain a healthy weight. Um, the dietary fiber is incredibly important for a uh, healthy uh, gut microbiome, which is really related, helps us with our metabolism and reduce inflammation in the body. The fat consumption, again, is appropriate, uh, low saturated fat, high unsaturated fats to reduce cardiovascular disease. Um, and there's lots of antioxidants and nutrients in plant foods. Um, that are super helpful to improve our vascular health and decrease the inflammation and reduce cardiovascular disease. And if you look, it's it's like there's many different kinds of plant-based diets, but they all work towards, you know, a little bit more in detail, these like processes where they decrease the oxidative stress and decrease like um, your um the the uh, inflammation and um, mitochondrial dysfunction that contributes to a lot of the chronic diseases. They all, these chronic diseases have a very similar pathway, similar path. And by addressing them, by eating more plant foods and replacing the animal products and the unhealthy refined products that we're eating with plant foods, then we actually see this kind of benefit. Um, the current American diet uh, is, you know, if we look at what people are currently consuming in America in terms of the calorie content, 56% comes from processed foods. A third comes from animal foods. Um, that's meat, dairy, eggs, fish, seafood, and cholesterol. That's found really only in animal foods. Um, and only 11% of the calories that we consume come from these super healthy plant foods that are actually promoting health. And really only half of those are coming from whole plant foods. So 5% of the foods that we consume are really helpful to us and the rest of the 95% are actually harming our health. So there's so much room for improvement. Um, and um, this is like, if you look at the left, like what a typical American is eating, we're trying to help patients move more towards the right-hand side because we know that by helping them to consume more of these whole plant foods and reduce the amount of refined products and added uh, um, animal products in their diet, we can see improvements, reductions in obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancers um, as well. Um, and you know, the uh, if you you know, this is the last I think or slide that I'll I'll share with information. But on the left hand side of this graph is actually looking at um, the dose of a plant based diet. Let's say for every um, uh, amount of plant foods that you consume, if you look at that that dotted line, the black dotted line that's called a plant-based index, you actually see a, a, a reduction in cardiovascular disease. Um, and then if you actually just incorporate healthy plant foods, that's the solid green line, that's a, even more of a benefit um, um, to the more healthy plant foods that you eat, you're gonna actually see improvement. If you actually are eating unhealthy plant foods, it's even worse than if you were eating an, a regular diet. Um, so that's the dotted red line on top. So what I take away from this that's really important is that it's really important that even if people don't want to eat completely a vegan diet or, uh, you know, hundred percent plant-based, every single step of the way that they incorporate more plant foods into their diet, their health is going to improve. Um, and what's really important is not to just tell patients to stop eating animal products, um, but to really replace those with healthy plant foods. Um, because if you're replacing your, um, your, uh, unhealthy or animal products with like French fries or apple pie, you're not going to see the health benefits. Um, so it's really important to not only tell patients not to try, try to avoid the animal products that are causing their health, but really replacing them with the foods that are super healthy for you. Um, and by doing so, we can actually treat the underlying causes of so many of our chronic diseases. Uh, this is how I was practicing medicine probably before I you know, took that one hour tour on the farm sanctuary. Um, I was literally just adding on more and more medications to people's uh, um, medication regimens uh, for their blood pressure and their diabetes. It was getting worse because I wasn't dealing with the underlying cause of their chronic diseases, the root cause 
which is an unhealthy diet and lifestyle. So um, by actually turning off the faucet, helping people eat a healthy diet, which incorpor which really involves uh, reducing the amount of animal products and replacing it with healthy plant foods, um, I was able to avoid, you know, what's happening here at this picture. So um, I think with that, I'll just stop sharing and maybe open the panel to some questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. That was great. Looks like we did have uh, quite a few audience questions, although some of them have already been answered. Uh, maybe uh, before we conclude the webinar, uh, Jamie, if you could repeat again um, how people could find the documentary, The Smell of Money. Yes, certainly. Uh, the, the film is now available to stream online, so you can find it on Apple TV or iTunes. Google Play, uh, YouTube, or Amazon, and it's $5 to rent or $15 to purchase. Amazing. Thank you. I want to give everyone on the panel a minute if, if anyone would like to share any additional concluding remarks. Dr. Gruen. Um, thank you all so much. This was such a terrific example of thinking about the sort of interconnected and really sort of overwhelming reasons for trying to move away from um, animal-based diets. Um, I think it everybody should recognize that it is this is not something that can change obviously overnight that this that and there's a number of different levels that are operating when we're thinking about making these changes some of them are health based and very individual some of them are family based and very much about being uh, having a certain kind of solidarity with the families of other animals um, but some of them are environmental, as we saw, and have to do with sort of longstanding conditions of exploitation and discrimination against humans as well. We didn't mention the horrible work that it is to work in these places. That's the one part of the story that we didn't have somebody talking about. But there's all, it's also very dirty work. It's hard work. And it's usually poor people of color and immigrants who are put into these facilities to do this dirty work. So there's all sorts of reasons for really rethinking um, how we engage with animals as food. And I hope that we were able to give you a lot of those reasons. I at least heard a bunch of them. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayek. Any final thoughts? There was a fantastic question in the comments about systems change, and I um, answered it uh, pretty quickly, but I just wanted to say more overarchingly here that I we absolutely need systems change because right now people are making a lot of unconscious decisions about their food choices and even what career they might get into. Um, and we need to be shifting the default and easy choice that there is to make towards more healthy, sustainable, and humane choices, both in our food environments for consuming food and in producers' environments uh, where they're producing them. As Lori mentioned, it's incredibly exploitative, both economically, uh, personally, and environmentally. It's an incredibly exploitative system. At the same time, I think it's a, a fiction that our individual choices are different from system choices. The best behavioral research evidence that we have shows that people who adopt more sustainable individual choices are more likely to advocate for, that doesn't mean they do advocate, but they're more likely to advocate for systemic changes. So we need to make and organize um, each other to make those systematic changes while at the same time, you know, putting our food dollars, our money, uh, where our mouth is. And I, I think with that, we actually have a, a, a bit of a formula for systems change that gets us towards a food system that is more equitable, healthy, and sustainable. Amazing. Jamie, any final comments? Sure. Well, thank you again so much for having me. This is such a fascinating and enlightening panel. And I think it the kind of content today really speaks to the fact that there are so many different reasons why we might pursue a more kind of plant-based lifestyle or, or work toward transitioning in that direction. That was certainly my own experience. You know, it was learning about this issue from so many different angles, the, whether it's the kind of animal, animal welfare side, the ethics side, or the, you know, the human rights or, you know, learning about my own health and how that could be improved by, by moving more toward a vegan diet. Um, that's what really inspired me. So just kind of wanted to note that, uh, 
you know, in, in terms of the, the question that we received about the evidence regarding changing hearts and minds, sometimes whatever it is that speaks to you may not be what resonates with other people. And, you know, our goal in, in creating the movie in particular was to try to reach people who may not care about chickens or who may not care about cows and who may be able to kind of look in the eyes of another human and say, what, what's happening to you is wrong and I don't want to be a part of that. So that's, I think, just something else to to kind of learn and think about is, you know, how are how are you going to be able to impact the audience that you're speaking to? And I think this presentation gave you probably a lot of good insight into some of the varied ways that you might be able to kind of bring people along on this journey with you, whether it's talking about climate or, or ethics, feminism, human rights, or, or their own health. So thank Fantastic, you so much. Dr. Shaw, any final comments? Uh, no, I just, I find it, it's so powerful to um, refer patients to um, documentaries because it does speak to them in a way that, um, that, you know, just sometimes maybe just help doesn't cause them to make changes. But when they see um, these documentaries and they see, for whatever reason, there's so many things that can resonate with them. And in a 20 minute visit, it's hard to figure out what it is that can resonate with the patient in front of you. But these documentaries like the smell of money or the twin experiment documentary series, they all kind of share shed light on all the different aspects of um, why one might want to reduce the amount of animals in their diet. Amazing. Well, thanks again to all of you. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We will definitely uh, send out a copy of this recording to all of you, as well as all the other registered participants who couldn't join live. So thanks again.